Our presenters today are Omar Saleme, Terry Roberts, and Brian Garrity. Omar, would you like to go and get us started? Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. So today we're going to be talking about advocating for digital tools during a global pandemic. And uh, with me today are uh, Brian Garrity, who is the Director of Procurement at Golden Gate um, Bridge Highway Transportation District. Thank you for joining us, Brian. My pleasure. And we also have Kerry Roberts, who is the Executive Director of Procurement and Warehouse Services at the Atlanta Public Schools. Thank you, Kerry, for joining us. Morning. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, as you have questions, as they come to your mind, please feel free to submit them via, uh, via the Zoom platform. We will have some time aside towards the end of the panel today to, to go through the Q&A and we'll, we'll leverage the expertise of our panelists today to kind of go through this. Um, quick agenda. So we're going to be first looking at this procurement reality, uh, especially during COVID and how that impacted procurement teams across North America. We're then going to be looking at the ROI of digital procurement tools. We're going to be covering some interesting stats and uh, metrics that we've been able to uncover in our state of the public sourcing report uh, and why this is the time to advocate for digitization. We're going to be looking at the, the cost of free tools in terms of sourcing and um, kind of things to think about when it comes to these, these platforms. And finally, we're going to end with uh, looking at the calculation of the digitization of, of uh, procurement and how you can get an ROI for your organization. And finally, we're going to end with uh, some, some Q&A. So this is roughly the agenda for today. Uh, I hope you find the, the content enjoyable. But without further ado, let's just kick it off uh, by looking at how, how COVID-19 impacted your, your agency. And so, you know, this is specifically to get an idea of how your respective agencies responded to COVID-19 and the transition for, uh, to remote work. And so this is a question to both panelists, and maybe we'll start with Gary on this one. Um, how were you impacted during the transition to work from home uh, during, during the pandemic? I think for us, the biggest impact was it forced our agency to trust us to work from home. Um, beforehand, there was the argument that, you know, we didn't need to work from home. We need to do everything in the office. And this was a, oh my gosh, on a Thursday, we decided on Monday we're working from home and it just happened. Um, so a lot of the fears that the agency had were kind of quelled because um, they had to be. Um, so that trust, I think, was, was the biggest thing. Um, and I think as far as their procurement team, it made my team embrace technology more. Um, I had an old school staff that likes their paper files and likes everything to be typed on triplicate and copies and so forth. And this has really forced them to embrace what the tools can do for us, especially Bonfire, um, but just what technology in general can do and to kind of let go of that, um, that connection to paper. So it's been good for us actually. It was kind of uh, uh, and, and Brian, how, how were you impacted by the transition to work from home? Well, similar to Carrie, it kind of forced our hand. Um, we, we actually had been set up um, with some employees working from, from home, but, but it was traditionally one day a week. Um, but uh, we had the tools available, which was great, and we are a pretty digital office. Now, uh, our IS department uh, was in the process of releasing additional tools uh, so like um, Microsoft Teams, um, and then we kind of sped that through the process. Um, but as far as working from, from home, we, we've had great success. We have all the tools that we need. Um, Carrie mentioned trust. I think that was a big thing and is probably a big thing for most uh, government or nonprofit organizations. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been over five months now. And uh, with all the tools that we have, uh, we uh, were very successful. And so, so we, we talked about trust a little bit. Um, do you see your teams returning to be 100% out of office? Or do you think the future after we emerge from this pandemic is going to be still a mix between work from home and work from office? And maybe we'll start with, with Brian on this one. Yeah, I think it's going to be a mix. Um, you know, with, with having all the tools in place, it's definitely a possibility uh, that we work more from home. There's still value in in in-person conversation and in-person meetings. You know, my organization is, is uh, maybe a, a little bit unique in that we actually operate 
three different businesses. We run a bridge, we run buses, and we run ferries. And being able to, to actually um, have face-to-face -face contact and conversation with the operations folks is valuable. Uh, with that said, I see um, huge time savings from a, a digital um, a workload. And, and you know, we live in, in operate out of the Bay Area, which is some of the worst traffic around. And a lot of our people commute an hour to two hours a day to get to work. Uh, that's time that could be spent uh, working. Uh, it's a good, it's a good chunk of time that could be spent doing other things with family uh, and, and a good work-life balance. So, I'm I'm definitely going to advocate for for more of work from home. Yeah. How about you, Carrie? Do you think it's going to be a mix for you? So for us, we're a little unique because we are a school system. So the thought from the the, the big top people have always been: if the teachers have to go in the employees should have to go in as well. This has kind of changed that way of thinking a little bit, um, but we are, at, um, as administrative employees, we're on that same path as the teachers. So as long as the teachers are out teaching from home and the kids are out, we will be out as well. Mm -hmm. When the kids go back, we'll model the same as them. If they go to a hybrid where they're half in, half out, then we'll do the same. So that's what we anticipate our next step is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at the, we're taking the first nine weeks to do completely digital. So in the middle of October is when we'll be looking at, you know, will we switch to a hybrid environment? Um, so we're right now, long term though, the, the thought process amongst a lot of the management is now that we've proven we are trustworthy, we're adults that will work on those days. Can we go to something like a one day a week, at least to, to dip your toe in the water with the yeah. long term? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's almost like a, a giant experiment that's taking place right now that all of us were forced to be a part of. And as we'll talk about in a little bit later, that also showed some, some tension or some fractures in, in teams that weren't digital ready when it came to, to that working from home. So it's, it sounds like the impact wasn't as uh, pronounced for you because you already had the tools in place. Right. Um, but that's certainly what we, we haven't heard from some of the teams that weren't um, kind of that digital ready mindset. So, so with that, I, I thought it would be good to kind of look at the new procurement reality because uh, obviously COVID changed a lot of things besides just working from home um, and there's a lot of impact on budget. So the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities projects the state budget shortfalls expected from COVID-19's economic fallout will total about $555 billion over state fiscal years 2020 to 2022. And, and programs like CARES help but they won't cover everything. And so as, as government agencies investigate, you know, how they can save costs in this economic climate, procurement will be called on to perform, you know, a formal review of all current contracts for viability, including deliverables, costs, you know, partner fit, and, and either canceling or renegotiating those contracts. So procurement also has a potential in the middle of this economic reality to, to amend or enter new agreements with vendors, that more closely align with the agency's uh, new priorities and available uh, budgets. And so in, in the heat of COVID-19, um, procurement teams were expected to be agile and get their uh, processes and get their projects over the line very quickly. And that's likely not going to change as cross-functional need and budget constraints pose you know, new challenges on, on us uh, and for procurement teams in the future. And this, this idea of you know, hasty patchwork processes or technologies that were implemented in the middle of the crisis need to be evaluated uh, to determine their sustainability for, for uh, the, this new reality. And so long and short of it is there's a budgetary crisis looming and procurement is, can play a very big role in, in mitigating those effects. And so Brian and Kerry, in a time of this budgetary crisis, um, are organizations looking to procurement teams uh, to ensure that tax dollars are being deployed efficiently. And also as a side question, uh, you know, how do you think technology can play a role in all of this? And we'll start with, with Gary on this one. So I think they're looking at us as procurement as a way to not only, you know, make sure we're being good stewards of the dollars, but to make sure that we are, um, being effective in what we're buying, that we are, especially with PPE, I think that's the biggest concern for us is how are we buying the PPE? Where are we getting it from? How are we vetting the suppliers? 
So by being able to utilize online tools, we have the ability to do, you know, have all that information very rapidly, send out quick quotes, get that information back, give us the time then to be able to do the reference checks and, you know, get samples and so forth. So I think that they're looking at us really more as the, um, the gateway for so many projects that products that are coming in. Um, for us as a school system, it's been a lot of online learning um, management systems. And because we have existing relationships with suppliers, we were able to utilize their platforms and so forth much easier um, because we already had had that digital resources. Um, but I think from tech playing a role, um, as we stay in this process, we're, we're coming out of crisis mode. So we've had, for us, exam for example, we've had our first day of school now. We've got those online platforms. The kids are, are in school and learning. But now we have time to think about if we're going to continue this long term, can we bid something or put out an RFP and not do an emergency like we had to, to do that ramp up? So the online tools are going to help us manage those long term plans much better than if we were you know, trying to fly by the seat of our pants long term. Yeah. That's great. Ryan, how about you? Do you think technology can play a role and uh, how are procurement teams going to be leaned on in this budgetary crisis uh, that, that's, that's coming? You know, at our district, our, our procurement team has really had to quickly become experts in products and technology that they had yet to uh, really source. Now, um, you know, we've always had masks and gloves and things like that. And we too have been, you know, California, we've got wildfires every year. So, so we got our N95s and things like that. But uh, you know, things like thermographic imaging systems, uh, you know, we never even had heard that term before, uh, you know, COVID. And, and the leaders of the organization really looked to our team to, to research, uh, to source, to price. We had to wade through, um, you know, unfounded delivery guarantees and fraudulent uh, vendors um, and things like that when the crisis first started. Um, and it, it was it was procurement that really took the lead on on the sourcing, which we should, uh, but but also becoming experts on on what we were sourcing quickly. Uh, technology definitely played a huge role in that. Um, you know, with with uh, all the platforms that are available out there for checking vendors and price comparisons and things like that, that really um, gave us an advantage. Uh, but in addition, uh, a tool like Bonfire really expands um, our reach. And, you know, we started getting um, more and more uh, interest from vendors across the country and not just locally, uh, which is a big benefit when you're, when you're, you know, you're in a big crunch and, and sourcing PPE is, is uh, extremely difficult. And technology is going to continue to advance um, and continue to allow us to collaborate with our peers uh, nationally and internationally. Yeah, and, and this was echoed by um, other panels that we've had in which procurement was suddenly relied on to, to, to get those PPEs. And, um, you know, I've heard stories of they got the pictures of the factories in China and immediately they said, there's no way we were buying from this. It's, it's a really sketchy product. But there was a lot of people taking advantage of, of organizations during that time. And procurement was kind of the, the sane mind in all of this, saying we should check for the, for the specifications and make sure that we're dealing with proper suppliers. So there was a bit of a sober-mindedness that we saw procurement kind of apply uh, during that, that big rush to buy, to buy PPEs. Um, so we're going to transition a little bit here now into uh, just to kind of re-articulate this new reality. And... Uh, this is where procurement is going to be relied upon to drive cost savings. Now, it's clear that procurement teams, I and mean, this is clear to us, you're not a cost center, but instead of strategic partner uh, in, your, in your agency. And the agency that is going to come out stronger, in our view, is one that will tap into procurement um, as a resource to save costs and drive better value. And procurement teams, in order to do this, they need to invest in the right technology to enable uh, their new responsibilities as strategic uh, advisors. And so we're going to be shifting a little bit to now starting to talk more about the ROI and back it up with a little bit of data from our state of uh, public sourcing report. But just to kind of give you, uh, you know, a quick intro to the ROI topic, 
you know, digital procurement tools can enable procurement teams to step into the role as strategic advisors as they help their agency save costs and, and drive better value. And now it's important to note that not all digital tools are created equal. And we'll go into more detail on how to calculate the ROI of these tools on the market later in the presentation. Um, but for now, let's just kind of go through some high level uh, you know, things to keep in mind when you're looking at these digital uh, tools. So first, you, you want to look at a centralized platform, meaning your stakeholders aren't spending all their time you know, searching for documents or completing manual tasks. So the more they can do in the product, the better. Um, data and insights, they should, you should have access to national uh, and local data and insights to help you optimize every bid and RFP for the best award value. And some of the data that we'll be talking about today, you can imagine that as being in that platform and being able to kind of help you make better, better decisions. Vendor experience and competition is really important. You know, e-sourcing makes uh, the, the process should, should make it easier for vendors to be, to be able to engage with you and it should be more manageable for them to be able to be aware of the projects that are available to them. And, you know, you want to be able to be able to manage that, that vendor database your, uh, yourself and be able to grow the vendor pool, something that Brian alluded to uh, earlier. So you can tap in to, to something outside of maybe the, what you're usually used to. Um, this to me, and the last one is the most important one, is the easy to use um, aspect of the platform. Uh, digital tools have to make it easy for non-procurement users to be able to engage with the procurement process and the sourcing process. That means the evaluators and the internal clients, internal auditors, as well as, uh, of course, the, the suppliers. So the question here is, um, and we'll start with, with Brian, what kind of ROI have you seen in your organization from having uh, a platform, a digital platform implemented? Um, you know, you talk about measuring ROI and it's always been a, um, a difficult task for procurement to, to measure um, savings. You know, generally speaking, um, governing bodies, boards, commissions um, always ask, well, how much are you saving us? And, and it, it's always been very difficult to, to measure that uh, from a dollar standpoint. Now, if you do uh, one type of sourcing one year and you do this exact same thing next year, um, you, can, you can calculate that, but, but generally nothing is ever the same. The market changes constantly. Uh, the vendor pool changes constantly and, and what you're sourcing changes constantly. So, so calculating a dollar savings uh, is difficult. And when you talk about the ROI on, a, on, on technology, uh, to me, it's a lot easier to articulate because uh, you, can, you can show the stakeholders um, what's in it for them. And for example, uh, you know, in, in California, uh, we get a lot of uh, PRA requests, Public Records Act requests. And uh, when I started with the district, um, our process was manual and we posted our procurements online, uh, but it's on a web page and we received paper copies. And so uh, when someone did a PRA request uh, through our district secretary's office, they would have to make tons of copies and, and um, our attorneys would have to go through submittals and contracts and take out proprietary information and redline and stuff like that. Well, well now um, that uh, we're completely digital, uh, the requests are less, um, you, you know, people can see who, been, which vendor was awarded the contract and how much, um, and if there are PRA requests, well, it's a heck of a lot easier because we pull a digital file uh, and it can, you know, we can email it uh, to anybody. Um, and then things like scorecards and comments, um, those are all digital, those can be shared. Um, so from, from a standpoint uh, with that stakeholder, it was obvious that it was going to save them a ton of time. And then you talk about uh, the vending community. Um, it's a lot easier for them to submit bids and proposals. Uh, they don't have to come to the Golden Gate Bridge and drop off a, a paper document. Um, so it expands, again, once, once again, it expands our reach because anybody can, can create a submission and digitally submit it. Uh, so when you talk to the vending community as a stakeholder, it's definitely a benefit to them too. And internally, um, the, the benefits are that, that evaluators don't have to all be in the same room. 
Uh, they can, we can have evaluators anywhere and we, we operate in, uh, uh, my district operates in five different locations in three different or different cities. So we've got people scattered around. So even internally, uh, the, the desire and the, the benefit of not having to come together uh, for evaluations uh, is, is definitely a, an ROI there. So, um, and then of course there's insight across the organization. They can see where their project is at, what stage it's in. And uh, so when I, when I talk about ROI of uh, digital systems, digital procurement tools, um, I focus on, on that, on the value that it's gonna bring in time savings, the value of increased information, the value of an extended vendor pool. And, and I think that really hits home uh, with, with all of the different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Brian. It's, beside, it's outside the sourcing process, like the, the public request, something you probably don't think of as often when you're evaluating a tool like this, but definitely has impacts on there and the compliance piece. Um, to date, no a single bid protest that has gone through the Bonfire platform has successfully materialized in court because all the comments are there. And usually when the legal team sees the due diligence that was taken uh, to make an award decision, they actually never proceed. And so there's avoided legal costs there that you can think of uh, as well. Um, yeah, C Carrie, do you have anything to add to that as well? So I, yeah, just a little bit. I agree with, with Brian, definitely um, just procurement's return on investment in general is that we reduce risk for the organization. So like you're talking about with the PPE supplies, are we getting hand sanitizer that's going to kill our kids? No, because we're, we're vetting it. We're, we're getting the spec sheets. We're specking the vendor. Um, as Brian said, the open records request is what we call them here in Georgia. And we have a digital tool for that. I just drop a file in, hit send, and it goes. It's awesome. But I think one that um, Brian didn't mention is the online tools give us the ability to switch gears so, like on a dime. Um, for example, two weeks ago, I, my department doesn't really handle construction contracting. Our facilities group has traditionally done that. And about two weeks ago, our attorneys said, oh, by the way, we think that needs to be in a procurement function now. So here you go. So taking what they did, which was a paper and pencil proposals, um, emails sending out, emails coming back in, and help with Bonfire's help, um, we have created new templates for our construction projects. In less than two weeks, we're going to put out our first RFP for a major school renovation $5 million project with uh, all the electronic tools in, in less than two weeks. So having a tool there, we were able to just completely upend our cultural, our culture and, and move forward. So that, that's been huge for us. Mm -hmm. That's a great anecdote uh, because construction is usually kind of like the last to come online, it seems like. But yeah, but now we're, we're dragging them kicking and screaming, but now they're, now they're with us. <laughs> yeah, and, and we've seen many, many examples of this, but yeah, and I think it's, uh, you're right though. I, mean, I think the pandemic, really uh, accelerated the velocity for adoption because people had to. And now you're seeing maybe a little bit more of a willingness on the construction side to actually put the projects in. Yep. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, uh, for that. Um, so now we're gonna switch gears again and uh, talk a little bit about the state of the public sourcing report that I've mentioned a couple of times. And then we're gonna dig into some data points uh, that we, we uncovered from the pandemic and then we're gonna have some questions uh, on those. And so, um, so we've kind of just talked quite a bit about the ROI. So we know sourcing tools have, have a significant ROI. Uh, the big question is, is now the time to invest in digital tools? And as procurement professionals, should you be advocating for them? And so, and we definitely get it. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a an, an health and economic crisis and uh, where you're likely be called upon to reduce the spend. So in the middle of all of this to go and advocate for digital platform, can seem daunting. And so hopefully some of the stuff we'll cover today will help with that. Um, but we've also have some good news. Um, and in the state of the public sourcing report that we re released just two days ago, uh, we've used survey data from RFPs from across the Bonfire database to specifically look at how COVID-19 has impacted procurement teams. And we'll go into some of the data in a moment, but ultimately uh, to give you the end of the story, we found that public agencies have a renewed appreciation for the role of public uh, procurement in times of crisis. Uh, we've already heard a couple of stories about PPEs and how procurement teams you know, uh, came in to help on that front. 
we also found that government agencies have seen some changing attitudes uh, towards technology. And again, this seems to be resonating with, with you as well. Um, and also the, the role in technology and what technology can play a role in ensuring that governments can continue uh, to meet the needs of their constituents, even when facing disruptions like the sudden work from home. So let's, let's take a closer look at the data and see how other teams were impacted uh, by COVID. Um, so the very first thing here is we looked at what type of projects are people uh, running during that period. And you'll see this is focused on from March 15th to April 30th of 2020. So in the middle of that period and those disruptions, the average organization was running two and a half RFPs and 4.3 non-RFPs, like a bid or invitational type of project. Um, a bonfire we've seen firsthand from our clients that public procurement teams have pivoted uh, their efforts to run more urgent bids with shorter timelines. And we have the data to prove that. So procurement teams suddenly were finding themselves, they needed to streamline uh, the sourcing process. And they've done this through a couple of different ways as far as data can, we can tell. Uh, the average evaluator went from four and a half evaluators on a project to 3.8, that's a 15% decrease. And across all projects, the number of pages per vendor submission went from 207 to 156 pages. That's a 25% uh, decrease. Likely because procurement teams were reducing and reprioritizing criteria so that proposals can be submitted by vendors and scored by evaluators more quickly. Um, and at Bonfire, we've seen our clients put non-emergency projects on hold to procure hand sanitizing stations, you know, clothing for hazardous, hazardous environments, for frontline workers and printing equipment uh, for the delivery of K-12 math modules, among many, many other COVID-related projects. Uh, all of these were done in record speeds compared to what we normally see from a procurement cycle. So a procurement really came in uh, to help when, when they were needed. Carrie and Brian, has this been the reality at your respective organizations uh, and has this reality affected your ability to evaluate projects and procure the supplies that you need? And uh, we'll start with Brian. Well, I would say for us, um, you know, obviously things uh, switched. Um, you know, in, in March when we all went on lockdown and finally realized the gravity of the situation that we were in, priorities did switch. Uh, priorities switched from uh, large planning projects um, to do we have enough masks and hand sanitizer to protect our employees and customers? Uh, you know, but, but I, I will say that luckily, um, you know, we've, we've been fully digital for, for years. And, and so the, the way that we did things didn't necessarily change. Um, you know, we, we, we still continue to, to source the way that we normally source it, just what we were sourcing, I think, changed. Now, as far as, as speed is concerned and, and the data that you, that you mentioned, I, I can definitely see that. Um, you know, but again, for us, I, I think that uh, um, it wasn't necessarily a, a change in, in mode or operations. It was just really a change in what and what we were sourcing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had, you had the infrastructure there, just you're pointing it in a different, different location. Um, and Carrie, how about you? So I think for us, it was a, more of a, a climb than an incline. Um, it was that first, oh my God, we have to have hand sanitizer, we have to have masks, let's get it done. But we also, since we're a school district, we, we understand what our use is just going to be. We know our enrollment numbers, we know how many staff we had. So we could say, okay, we're going to need 350,000 disposable masks to get us through the first six months. So I was able to purchase, get those done, and now we can focus on our regular business because we still have to have, the schools are under renovation, we still need the desks, we still need the, the books, we still need all of that. So by having the digital tools in place to handle the projects we would have normally had, we could focus our efforts on those emergency things like the PPE where it was, oh my God, drop everything and get this done because we knew how to maintain our operation. I think that, that was the biggest thing is we could maintain how we normally worked and still have the time to focus on the emergencies because we we've been using such the tool for so long that it was just second nature yeah and, and, 
to me, what this highlights to um, is if you didn't have these tools in place, now you're struggling to even run your current opportunities, let alone to find new PPE suppliers. Right. And, and you're juggling one more challenge that none of us were prepared for when suddenly working from home. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, to me, that's, I think, why procurement was highlighted during that time. You know, for, for the first time in forever, supply shortages were entering the, the lexicon. Everybody was talking about supply chain. Um, and in the middle of this was this procurement team that not many people were aware of uh, on the public side. And now they're seeing the effectiveness of those teams to actually bring those you know, critical supplies in. Um, and so, yeah, the ability to have the infrastructure in place to enable you to do that is, is very, very important. Um, so now we're gonna look at another uh, data point that was covered in that uh, report that I mentioned, which is related to when people are completing their evaluations, which is kind of the same thing that we talked about earlier and being able, like with Brian's organization, it's a distributed office under normal circumstances, but now everybody's working from home. It's truly a distributed office. So how did that impact when people did their evaluations? And so we can tell in Bonfire when people can put in scores when they log in. And based on that, we can tell if they're working outside of work hours or within work hours. So 21% of evaluations are now being done outside of office hours. That's a 62% increase over uh, pre-COVID uh, time. So people are working outside of the regular, uh, you know, nine to five, so to speak. And that kind of makes sense because most people in North America uh, can experience and continue to experience this kind of breakdown between the barrier between work life and, and home life. And so the trend is not really surprising, but I think the data uh, does serve as a reminder of the role that digital tools can play in ensuring procurement and non-procurement users alike can work around other responsibilities and priorities while working from home. Uh, I can't even imagine delivering boxes of paper to five or six different households to come to a good compliant decision if you didn't have the ability to do that. And so uh, the question to the panelists, would you say uh, this trend rings true for your agency, people kind of shifting their work hours? Uh, and how have digital tools helped your procurement and non-procurement users in the past few months? Uh, I'll, we'll start with, with Gary on this one. Okay, so it's been a big concern for us, the work-life balance. And somebody just put in the chat, homeschooling. That's huge. When we went into this, we were fortunate um, in my division. I work with the CFO directly. And she's got two small kids herself. So she was like, I don't expect you to be glued to your computer for eight hours a day with a half hour lunch. She said, I expect the work to get done. When you get it done, great. That's up to you, but it just needs to be done. Make sure you're answering emails, make sure you're answering IMs, but you know, get the work done. One of the things that we are seeing though, and especially with my team, the ones of those of us that don't have children at home to homeschool or to, to take care of, is that we're working more um, because it used to be, for me, I would go to work, I would leave my computer there, I would come home and I would be home. But now my computer's here, it's in my kitchen. So when I'm cooking and I'm waiting for the water to boil, I'll just come over and toggle over and check my email. And so that makes me sit down and, and do more. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing that from my team as well. And we are noticing that from the evaluators. Um, I'm seeing emails that'll come in at midnight, you know, one o'clock in the morning. And it's like, people, you know, people need to sleep, stop this. So we're definitely seeing that. But um, our superintendent is very supportive of us, you know, working during work hours, but then being flexible when necessary. Um, so, so it's huge. Um, but one of the things I like from a technology standpoint is having the tool um, allows us to, to work within um, some constraints with our evaluators. Because in the past, um, we've had issues with the evaluators taking three, four, five months to get things done. And when, we, when we're on them about why aren't you evaluating, you know, oh, well, because I'm, I'm in the office, I'm doing so much. Now it's like, okay, get it done. And we have an audit trail to show their supervisors, hey, they're not they're not doing their par. So don't come to us screaming, you need this project done next week when it took you six, six months to evaluate it. So, you know, I think that's one of the things I really appreciate about the digital tools is having that audit trail mm -hmm. um, for that. But I think in general, we are seeing people working more um, and the, the work-life balance isn't where it should be. I don't, I don't think personally. Yeah, you made a great point there, Gary, about people have children, sometimes they have to homeschool them. So the ability to kind of shift your work hours, being flexible, 
is essential in, in this kind of reality that we're all in. Yeah. Brian, how about you? Did you see similar trends, Gary, or anything different? You know, um, it, it's interesting. You know, people that have been in this business as long as I have remember the days where, um, and you know, many probably still do, you'd have to, you know, you'd go through the entire evaluation process and you'd have your meetings and, and you get to a contracting phase and the contract was finally negotiated and then you have to print out three copies of it, send it off to the consultant to sign via mail. Uh, then they'd have to mail it back. Sometimes they would get lost. You'd have no idea where it's at. So, you know, all the way from, from that stage to where we are now with, with our digital procurement tools and using things like DocuSign um, has, has greatly increased the speed of the final product. Um, you know, and, and this, this graph that you have on evaluations, I think is very poignant and, and to me is one of the most significant um, uh, things that has happened in the digital procurement world in the last few years. Um, you know, when I, when I first started uh, uh, with the Golden Gate District uh, five years ago, and I came from an organization that had digital procurement tools and came to the district and they didn't. And I remember one of my, uh, my senior staff said, I, I, need to, I need to purchase a rolling suitcase. And I said, well, why do you need a rolling suitcase for work? And she said, because I got to transport all those proposals to the meetings. And to me, that was, that was just, you know, the, the icing on the cake. I said, we, we've got to fix this and we've got to fix it quickly. And, and the evaluation process has become much more streamlined, um, a lot easier, a lot quicker. And what Carrie mentioned in that you can, um, at least through Bonfire, we can see the progress of our evaluators and know exactly how much they have done. And, and you can have the automated reminders that go out to them. You can also give them a little poke and say, hey, I see that you're halfway through. Uh, make sure that you're complete by, you know, Friday. Um, so that insight into the, the, the evaluators um, process and progress in the evaluations is fantastic. And not having to have a, a suitcase for work is really, uh, has really been a benefit in the digital procurement. It's an interesting story, Brian. I've actually seen, you know, the trolleys that they used to put TVs on when you're watching a movie in class. Uh, I've seen that being used as well to carry boxes. Um, it was at a hospital setting and different doctors, different buildings. So yeah, that visual is, is very there in my head. Um, so we're going to look at another, uh, another uh, stat that we, we uncovered in this report. And this relates to the categories of projects that were being run. Um, and we're comparing this again to last year's data for the same period of time. So compared to last year, public organizations are conducting 37% more telecom bids and RFPs. Um, and some of this already came out in the conversation already. But to give you an idea of across the board, what we saw, telecom competitive events and education specifically have increased by 219%. And uh, telecom competitive events and municipalities increased by 118%. And so although public agencies have typically viewed IT and software as, as expendable cost, as many organizations have had to make the jump to remote work, you know, software services that enable remote work communication have become critical uh, to existing business continuity. Um, and so, so that's something we've, again, heard quite a bit already, uh, where students have to be kind of learning from home now. So that's why we see a, a higher increase in, in, in education. But similarly, we even talked about DocuSign earlier, being able to kind of distribute things like that and get agreement and, and, and signatures becoming more and more critical. Um, and all of that would have been under, under those categories that we, we just talked about. And so um, then it becomes a question of, now that remote work is a reality, how have procurement teams adjusted their processes to work remotely? Um, so 90% of procurement teams, and this is through a survey that we've done, uh, said they consider digital procurement platforms an important pillar of their business continuity plan. It's 90%. 25% um, said they were looking to implement a solution. And 65% said they were currently using a platform. 73%, 73% of respondents said COVID-19's effects caused their organization to realize how vital digital procurement is to business continuity. 
and, and their organization will continue to make it a priority. You know, the data shows that procurement teams have a unique opportunity to advocate for digital tools during this time. There was double whammy there. You had more critical bids and contracts to get in a time when you had almost no tools to do that and you had to work from home. And so that made it really, really difficult causing this kind of change of perception of digital tools and why procurement digitization is important. The question is, do you agree with this, the panelists? Uh, have you seen a realization of how vital digital procurement is to business continuity in your or organization? And I know you've already had the systems in place. I wonder if there's a renewed sense of confidence that we made a good decision there. Um, and would you say that procurement is now seen as an essential service? And we'll start with Brian on this one. You know, um, luckily, again, for, for, for myself and our organization, we had a platform in place. Um, we had uh, procurement staff that would occasionally work from home. Um, and, and, but even with that, um, you know, generally business continuity plans, um, at least ones that I've worked on, don't include long-term pandemics. Um, you know, they're traditionally in our area, an earthquake, a fire, a flood, something that is, uh, you know, definitely a, a lot more short term than, than what we're going through now. Um, so the longevity of this, I think, has really shown the value of, of digital procurement and the ability to um, uh, do everything remotely. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, luckily we already had the tools in place. Uh, we did expand on it a little bit. I remember um, in the, you know, back in March in the early goings, um, we had to make sure that all of our staff had laptops. Um, and most of them did, but, but we were also then looking at uh, uh, making sure people had, you know, docking stations and, and appropriate monitors and things like that at home so they could could adequately do their work from home. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny that you bring this up, and I'm sure Carrie has a lot more experience in this than I do, but there was a, new, a national news program this morning on shortage of laptops. And because of all the kids that are going back to school and everybody having to, to you know, work remotely, um, I know that, uh, it, that that's not just a, um, a personal purchase, that's our, also an organizational purchase because many of these schools are distributing those laptops. And, and the ability to, to source those and buy those, um, you know, if you've got a digital procurement tool and you have data coming in and you can, you can expand your vendor database, I think that's going to be a lot easier for, for those large type of purchases that are going to be vital going forward for organizations like Carrie's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vendor pool becomes really important in a time of shortages, as we've seen with the PPEs, and now it seems like laptops are, are the next one. And Gary, I, I know we talked a little bit about that. Do you, you want to tell us about your laptops experience? Laptops were huge. Um, so we, we jumped on that bandwagon very quickly because we knew where we were going. Um, by the end of our school year last year, we wanted to make sure all of our kids had a device of some sort, including a laptop or a tablet. We got it up to about 80% by the end of the year. That gave us the summer to source. Um, but it, it was huge because not only the availability, um, it was the manufacturing. Because when China shut down, the manufacturing plants of most of the technology shut down. So it, it's bad. But even like this last week, um, they were talking on our first day of school call. We have a task force for that. And I remember I have a laptop in my office that we don't use. It's for you know when we had an extra employee. So I called the IT director and said, I have a laptop. He's like, I'll be right there to get it. I mean, he personally came and took it from me. That's how desperate we are for that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, overall, looking at the agencies and, and their attitudes towards us, I think um, the biggest thing I have to say is that we've, we, we look very good right now. <laughs> there hasn't been a single slowdown due to procurement um, in our agency because we had tools in place um, to keep them along. And then when there were potentials for other slowdowns, like we talked about with facilities, because we're able to bring them on board with us on the, the tools quickly, some potential slowdowns were avoided because we had the tools in place already. So, you know, I think that we're, we're going to come out of this um, with a little bit of a better reputation, you know, purchasing is the department of no, and that's where things slow down. And um, I think we're, we're definitely coming out looking a little better than, than before. Yeah. I, I 
definitely see this as a golden opportunity for procurement as well. Um, there's a sudden realization again of how strategic this department is and they can help us buy things. And guess what? That's what they do best. And in the time of crunch, we need to, to uh, rely on them to make sure we were supplied. And yeah, like PPE is an, is an extreme example because it's health related, but now we're talking about another year or so of this and laptops and other communication tools become more and more necessary, necessary for this. Um, so I'm just trying to find my mouse here. So now we're gonna shift towards uh, the actual calculation aspect of the ROI. And so with Gary just mentioned, this was a great segue into this. You know, we feel like now is a time to, to advocate for digital tools. Um, and from this data, from the state of public sourcing report and our conversations with the panelists, uh, there's a lot of proof that despite the current climate of budgetary restrictions and having to do more work with less, now is the time to advocate for digital tools that will enable procurement to thrive in a time when they're needed most. And we saw this, you know, that there's a new found appreciation for the role of procurement and the role that it plays in a crisis, especially as teams adapt their processes to ensure, you know, their agencies um, and their constituents get the goods and services as quickly as possible. So that nimbleness is becoming a key thing that procurement teams are being relied upon. And we also found that there are changing attitudes towards technology in the public sector. So now that we have, uh, now that we know that, now is the time to advocate for digital tools. What type of tools should you be uh, looking for? So the first one we want to discuss and get out of the way um, is the ROI of a, a, free, a free tool. And because there's a cost to that. Um, and so I, I totally get it. And then this climate of budget reprioritization and an emphasis on cost savings, you know, cheap or free tools might look appealing, but procurement professionals know best that cheap does not mean best value. And so, you know, that could come at the cost of lack of professional services to ensure your success once you implement the platform. If a solution is free or cheap, you need to look at where they're cutting the costs. You know, often this means the service level is gonna be not as good as it should be. There could be no client experience team to ensure your success. During the implementation, you know, your stakeholders might not be supported and most importantly, your vendors and evaluators uh, are not getting kind of the, the training and support that they need when they need it most. And so that affects all groups. So when it's time to implement, do you wanna answer those questions yourself or do you wanna have a team kind of by your side to help you get this adoption of your organization? You also have no control over the vendor experience many of those free solutions are actually shifting the cost of the vendors. Uh, so not only are these typically, they offer a poor experience for the supplier um, because they actually can't access the bid often or the documents until they kind of pay. Uh, vendors can feel unfairly penalized by, by the fees they are forced to pay. And this removes the ability to create a collaborative approach with them. Um, and because of this obstacle that we're putting in terms of you have to pay to play, um, you know, you're not going to be growing the vendor pool as much. And when you need those laptops or PPEs, um, you're going to have a narrower set of, of vendors to, to approach and, and get to your comp competitive solicitation. Uh, finally, and this is really important for public sector, is privacy concerns. Some of these free solutions are actually monetizing your data by selling it. Uh, and so when you don't own the data, it definitely opens your organization to to legal risk. So when we talk about ROI, we thought it was important to kind of talk about what free tools are because they could seem to have a really good ROI, but there's a lot of caveats uh, in there as well. Um, our view on that, and this is increasingly what we hear from our client base, is that the procurement team of the future is connected and your platforms and tools that you use have to reflect that. So, and this is the theme of this year's NIGP uh, forum, you know, connecting procurement uh, communities. And that's because the, the procurement team of the future is connected to your procurement peers and your colleagues and evaluators, your suppliers, and, and the constituents that, that you serve. Um, and the result of these connections are better value RFP decisions and not RFP decisions that make all of your stakeholders happy. And that's where we think the sourcing, uh, e-sourcing software ROI uh, comes in. So now we're going to shift into um, the practical aspect of this, which is how do we calculate the ROI of digital tools? Uh, so as you're evaluating the digital platforms to determining uh, the ROI, ask yourself these questions. You know, is this tool simply automating 
my existing process or is there is it connecting me to my peers, stakeholders and vendors and constituents? What will the adoption be like? There's no point getting a tool that's gonna have low adoption that people don't wanna use. And that's really important. Uh, will this platform provide me with insights, templates from my procurement peers so I can make data-driven RFP decisions? You know, more and more procurement is being asked to be data-driven and these tools should enable you to do that. Uh, Omar froze. Always the case. Um, and will I be partnered with professional services, uh, you know, team to support this implementation? So these are some of the questions. But I want to turn it to Brian and Carrie. Um, you know, to you, what does building an ROI case look like? We already touched on that a little bit. Um, and how does it look different for different stakeholders? And we'll start with with uh, Carrie on this one. Okay. Um, well, going back to some of the, um, the points we made earlier, it's very hard to, to put hard dollars onto anything that we in procurement do. But for, for me, what I look at are the things that you've got listed, um, especially like you've mentioned the templates. So for, for me, return on time is my biggest investment, is my time for my, my team. So being able to build a bid template, an RFP template, a construction template that really 10 documents never change. The two documents that change are the ones that my team just drag and drop into that project and then boom, they're gone. So instead of having to go through and create documents every time, I've got this template. So the time it takes to, I would say, load a procurement is probably an hour at the most, as opposed to five or six hours when you have to build it from scratch each time. Um, and then really the vendor experiences is key. For us, um, we are trying to build a minority and women owned business um, program. And when you're looking at those free tools, um, they're free to us, but the vendors have to pay. So when you're a struggling small business, you're a new small business or a minority business, that $95 per agency or per county, that can add up. So that, that's a huge one to consider. And then really finding that partnership, um, that last one, that, that is key for us. There's not a single time that I can think of in the last year and a half I've been with APS that I have not sent an email to someone at Bonfire and said, oh my gosh, how do I? And within 15 minutes, I've got a response. I've got a training set up. I've got a, oh, we have this video. So whether it's Bonfire or another tool, that's huge to just know you have that support. The free ones may not give you that much support. Um, and, and just to know that, and like for me, there's things that I've said, hey, have you, can you do this? And the response is, no, but that's a great idea. Let me talk to the developers. You know, we wanna make sure whoever you're partnering with is a, is a team with you um, to, to judge your needs and their needs combined. So I think time is the biggest one. Um, and it's about, what else did I have written down? I think. Yeah, time. That's the big one for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and time enables us to be more strategic to me, right? We get away from doing the monotonous task of combining Excel sheets and delivering documents to people. Then we have time to do market research and, and ask harder questions at the outside of the project, which ultimately leads to a better decision. Yeah, um, yeah. Brian, Brian, what are your thoughts on that? I know you had to kind of do, do this process yourself a few years ago. You know, um, I mentioned earlier in the uh, conversation about uh, you know when you're when you're trying to sell uh, investment in these types of tools, you have to look at what's in it for the particular stakeholder that you're that you're meeting with and, and discussing with. I think as procurement professionals, we can all see regardless of what digital tool you have um, or that you want to get, you can see time savings. You can see how it affects your department. Um, but conveying that return on investment to how it affects others across your organization is the tough thing. Um, and I do wanna, even though you both have talked about it, I do wanna to touch again on, on the free tools. And um, as we all know, especially procurement folks, nothing's free. Uh, so the first thing that you wanna do when you come across something that's, that's, that's uh, supposedly free is ask them, where's your revenue coming from? And, and all businesses have to have revenue to survive. And if that revenue is coming from uh, the vendors, um, you, ne you need to consider heavily on whether you think um, a, that procurement should be promoting um, uh, that sort of, of payment, pay to play, 
or are we really, and I think everybody would probably agree, are we there to support full and open competition? And, and open um, doesn't mean that you have, you have to pay. Now, uh, I understand that uh, a, a lot of tools offer um, free access to vendors, and then they can also um, pay for additional access or additional benefits or additional services, and that's fine. Uh, but, you know, the, the ability to access um, government uh, procurements and sourcing opportunities, I think, should be free to all. Um, free to all vendors and, and, and easy to access as well. You mentioned ease of use of tools. So I did want to, uh, you know, touch on that again. And, and, uh, but, but again, you know, talking about the uh, calculating the return on investment, um, you know, it's, it's not only a sourcing tool that, that should be digitized, but you need to think about things like um, uh, the ability to do online um, pre-solicitation conferences. Um, you have to have the tools to be able to do that, especially now. You know, um, I, I can tell you again from uh, where we're at um, and where my district is located, it's really hard for a vendor outside our region to get to a, um, a pre-solicitation conference, especially if they have to fly here and get a hotel. And I mean, that could be a really expensive thing for, um, so they have to, to, to look at that on, on what their possible return is for the contract that they could possibly get. But when we do it online, oh, wow, you know, that just opens it up to everybody. Um, doing online bid openings. If you're required to do public bid openings, which most of us are, uh, well, public now doesn't necessarily mean in person. So having tools available to, to do that and, and um, uh, broadcast that, that bid opening uh, is something that I think everybody should look at. So, you know, we've got, we've, there's tools available that, um, you know, can take the procurement process from beginning to end and making sure that you have all those tools in place. It opens the competition that streamlines your business, uh, that saves time, which then saves money. Um, I, I, think, I think that that's gonna, be a, that's gonna be the future for all of us. Absolutely, and I, just to, to kind of recap, I think this is the opportunity that we have with COVID. Again, it forced us into this uh, worldwide experiment of working from home. And procurement teams specifically we're asked to do even more with less or sometimes with nothing in terms of digital, digital platforms. Um, and so that double whammy really kind of highlighted the importance of the procurement teams and for them to be equipped with the tools that they need to do their job no matter where, where they are. Um, we're, we're coming up to time here, so I wanna leave some time for the Q&A. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this is kind of the last slide here. Um, so why don't we go through some of some of the questions that have sub been submitted and I'm just about um, looking to, to open them but I'm having a little bit of trouble. While you're looking for that, Nora, we had a lot of uh, people ask about the uh, slide deck and if that would be made available to everyone. And so, um, get it from Buffer and uh, add it as a link on the forum microsites that people can go uh, the schedule one day, if they'd like. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, would you mind going through the questions here? For some reason, it's not opening up uh, for me. Sure thing. So uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, working from schools from a, like the idea of using bonfire. However, I am worried about the vendors. For some, the smaller and less tech savvy, maybe less likely to know how to bid way compared to sending in an actual hard copy and do some vendors have trouble bidding with e-procurement in your experience? I can take that one. Um, we actually have seminars that we hold with our communities. They were in person, but now we can do them virtually where we walk vendors through. So when we do a pre-bid, for example, we actually walk the vendors through the bonfire submission process. We, we create a fake vendor and um, we, we walk through as, we're, as we are that person submitting. Um, so we actually, we think it's easier for them in the long run. And I'll add to that, you know, not, um, I agree that it, it that it's much easier, um, you know, and take for example, I, I, you know, I continuously talk about our location, 
but the Golden Gate Bridge doesn't have a physical address. Um, so when, when people would, would mail things to us, um, sometimes it would get lost. Um, if you had to drop something off, um, you know, you can imagine the amount of traffic and people that you'd have to wade through. Um, you know, Carrie talked about um, construction being the, the, the last adopters. Um, but when you think about, um, for me and past organizations, our contractors would always be um, out at their truck um, with their, their bids op yeah, open on the, on the hood of the truck at the last few minutes trying to write their prices in and then, you know, run up and, and what happens if the, the elevator's broke and you're on the sixth floor, you know, um, they don't have to do that anymore. So the, uh, the benefit to the vendors, I think, is, is huge when you look at these types of uh, uh, digital procurement tools and, and holding sessions to advise them on how to, to properly submit is just great. And I can tell you, um, at least I know from using Bonfire, they actually have a video that walks vendors through how to submit you know, the submission process. One other, one other thing that's helpful for the vendors too is instead of giving us six packets that are this thick and hoping that they remembered every form, we've broken up our templates and if the form is a required document for submittal, it won't let them submit unless they have that form. So it's easier in the long run for them because they know if the system let them submit, they had everything required. Now that doesn't mean they fill it out correctly, but they had them. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, something. I, right, but I know we've all had that frustration when we've looked through a bid document and there's a form that's missing and we've had to deem them non-responsive because that's, that's how it's required. So this, this helps you know, negate that issue as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, I can also say the data that we have is that suppliers of all types and shapes are able to kind of use this. And the way I kind of um, help visualize it is my, my grandfather is on Facebook posting pictures of, of the grandchildren. Uh, not me, other grandchildren. But, but it's interesting because the process by which you upload a bid is very similar to that too. You know, you're taking a file from your computer and you're dragging and dropping it into a slot and then you're pressing submit. So that process by which we upload files, whether through attachments of email, I think there's a general education and tech savviness that a minimum that we all kind of elevated to. And uh, bidding is kind of the same thing, just it's, it's just not a picture that you're uploading. Great. I work for a very small agency. I do not procure any commodities. I do procure professional services contracts and on, and on calls. Considering solicitation requirements, is there a minimum amount of solicitations that you would consider enough to make it make sense? Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I can I can talk about that a little bit, and I think that's a great question. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily look at it from a numbers standpoint. I'd really focus on the time. So um, I think, as we all know from from um, our own organizations, the biggest cost to uh, the organization is people. And um, so so when you look at the value that you could gain from an online procurement tool. You need to look at it um, from how much time you would save. Um, is, you know, if, if you're doing enough solicitations that you're needing to hire a new person, well, um, not that I'm against hiring people, of course, but, but it might be such that you know, uh, you know, a few thousand dollars spent on a, a digital tool will save you um, having to, to hire another person. I know in our own organization, we can't hire people right now, right? We, you know, all of our, all of our um, uh, recruitments are on hold. Uh, I personally have three open positions in my department and we're not, you know, we're not gonna get anybody anytime soon. Um, so, so look at it from a time saving standpoint, also look at it uh, from a, I mentioned it prior, but a, a time savings as, aspect for other people in your organization from, from the open records request to the evaluators to people accessing uh, the status of their documents. So I, I'd focus at, you know, again, not numbers, but, but uh, time and access to information. So to tag onto that, um, that's a great segue, Brian, because where I was gonna go with that is 
we've been talking about the online digital procurement tools for solicitations only, but we haven't looked at the other areas that we can use them. Um, for example, vendor registration. We have our ERP system that we have to enter our vendors into, but we have documents that are required like their W-9, their E-Verify forms, all these documents that we were insurance. We were waiting and getting hard copies of hard papers and emails and then emailing back and forth with the vendor saying, we got your application, but we didn't get your W-9. We were doing all of that manually. And about a year ago, we turned on the vendor registration tool in Bonfire. So now when a vendor goes to register, they fill all that out. Um, they type it all out. How many vendor registrations do you get where you can't read their email address? So then you don't know how to contact them. So it's all online where they type it out. They have to upload their W-9. They have to upload an E-Verify. They have to upload their insurance or it doesn't even come across as a registered vendor. It's the way we have it set up and agencies can set that up however they want, but that's how we have it set up. So that saved us time. Another thing is the contracts management module. We use that. It's been a blessing. We've got all of our contracts that have been from formal solicitations. We have them all entered into Bonfire starting from 2017 on now. So when a user department says, hey, can I get a copy of the contract? We say, sure, go to Bonfire and click on it. It's all loaded there. It does automatic um, notifications for renewals. So if you've got contracts that are expiring, you've got, let's say you did a pool vendor contract for plumbing suppliers and it expires in September. On July 1st, it will send out the end user um, email to the end user saying, do you want to renew? And then we can send letters to the vendors. We can put when insurance expiring and send notices to the vendors it, through the system that their insurance is expiring. So it's not just the solicitation tools, but it's the whole package you need to look at where it can save you time. So if that, you know, with the contracts that you're doing, even if they're not formal solicitations, you can still add them in as contracts that need to be renewed and so forth. So the other portions are, are huge, not just the solicitation modules. Mm -hmm. One quick thing I'll add on to that is, uh, we talked about the budgetary crisis that's looming and uh, in the conversations with clients, the, the position they're taking is anything to Carrie's point that is expiring or up for renewal, um, they're rebidding those and they're involving more people within their organization below a certain threshold. If you do have a kind of a pseudo decentralized procurement system and getting uh, those people into the mix so then they can drive more savings because Although telecom purchasing is on the rise, a whole bunch of initiatives were put on hold. So there's a, a hunger among vendors to kind of compete and give you a good price. So there's a really good opportunity to think beyond just the things that you normally go through a formal process and put more of the simple bids, low threshold uh, dollar value projects into uh, a competitive or a competition to, to drive more savings. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm happy to stay, to stay here if we have a question or two left. All right, I, I'm sorry, Omar, I wanted to jump in. Um, one of the questions was about um, small construction companies not taking the time to understand. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to, to mention too is when a vendor registers with an online digital e-procurement e platform, it's not just for Carrie Roberts bids at City of Atlanta Public Schools. They can get notices from all over the country, all over the world, and whoever's in the system if it's the right commodities. So there's a benefit to them. And sometimes when you explain that, that it's not just, you're not just doing it for me as the city schools, you're, you're doing it so you can get notices from all over. They're a little more apt. That, that's a good way to convince them that it's worth their time to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, we have three minutes left, so we can maybe squeeze in a quick question. Um, if, if we have one more. Sure. Can entire agency use Bonfire to view contracts? How does licensing work? Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll take that one on. Um, it's, it's free for people to, anybody within the organization, you can give them access to uh, like a subset of the, of the contracts if they belong to a department or, or everything. Uh, but there's no licensing required to access the contract. Um, with, with two minutes left, I want to make sure I've taken the time to thank our panelists today for for the feedback and ideas um, and, and conversation today. Um, hopefully, I see the comments coming in. I think people really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I will say that, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I've had uh, a lot of experience now dealing with, uh, with COVID and procurement and how people have been able to navigate this. Um, and again, thank you for, uh, for your questions and interest and attention today.
Uh, again, thank you again, Carrie and Brian. Hopefully we can next soon. Been a pleasure. Happy thank to you. be here and I'll, I'll also I offer that if anybody has any follow-up questions um, regarding bonfire or anything else, uh, they can feel free to email me at any time. Me too. Thank you so much, guys. And and please stop by our digital booth. We'd love to uh, to see you there too. Thank you so much. Uh, see you hopefully in person at the next NIGP and, uh, and take care all. Enjoy Bye. the conference, everybody.